Thank you, John, for uh, for having us, and um, and thank you for sharing your Friday afternoon. Um, what what um, what I've been asked to do is really do a, a, a 101 introduction to this thing called payments for ecosystem services. Um, and so I apologize to folks that have been involved in this more. This is really kind of an orientation. Um, following my brief presentation, we'll hear from Aldo Mania, who's going to talk a little bit more about the country of Costa Rica and the innovation that's happened in that country around these issues. So um, behind all of this introductory material is a lot more stuff. So folks who are, are interested in getting more, you'll, you'll have a chance to, uh, to dig deeper than this. So um, first, when we think about um, ecosystem services, it's a, it's a relatively new term to be uh, in, or in, in terms of its, its use in a, in, a, in a broader community. And I think it's powerful for a couple of reasons. One is, um, we have, growing up in the, in the world of conservation, we have struggled for decades, literally, to try to figure out how do we link issues of conservation to the needs of societies. And we've always struggled, well, biodiversity, and that doesn't really work. And, and all of those terms that we use would never really work. Ecosystem services as a term, I think, is very powerful conceptually because it links what the natural systems the, the planet provides to the needs of society. So when we think about ecosystem services, we're talking about things like um, air quality and, uh, and soil formation and pollination, things that are, that are relevant to society in a lot of ways. So for the for the, and in one way, that's a really powerful new paradigm, if you would, around thinking about conservation. Ecosystem services links it to the needs of society. Um, the, the second thing that's important about this uh, term of ecosystem services is people are talking about markets or payments for ecosystem services. So, so all of a sudden, we're talking about some very significant new revenue sources different revenue for sources that are flowing into conservation that have been in the past. This is just an example of forests and, and some, of the, uh, some of the services that they're providing that historically have really not been there. We think about forests, uh, you know, as a trained forester, the, the challenge has always been we look at a forest and we say, timber, the value of your forest is what we can do if we cut it down and, and put it into timber. What we're seeing is a really revolutionary shift where we're going beyond the value of that timber uh, to the value of standing forests. And so here's just an example of a suite of, uh, of, uh, of some of these new revenue sources that would be part of what we call uh, ecosystem service payments and markets. Um, to make sure that we're, we're a, a challenge of this is it's really a new vocabulary, a lot of new words, and, and there are a lot of people in this room that would probably know ecosystem services, ecosystem service payments, we probably would have a very different definition, each of us, of that. So it's really important to get the vocabulary right. And first of all, on the payment or the market side, there really are a range of different types of markets or payments that are developing around these uh, emerging environmental markets. The first uh, we call self-organized private deals. The great example is uh, Perrier, bottled water. Perrier is a company entered into a contract with um, French landowners that were sitting around the sources of their water. It was a straight deal. Uh, so it's a self-organized private deal. Um, the second um, example that we talked about are public payments to, uh, to private land and forest owners. A great example of that is uh, about 10 years ago now, there was a New York City water deal that is uh, that is um, referred to quite a bit, where the city of New York, instead of doing the traditional technology, technology approach to improving water quality, actually invested in their watershed, which is the Casco. So they made payments to forest landowners, to agricultural uh, uh, producers in that, region, in that region, to protect that natural filter of that water. And, and many of us, when you go to New York, if you'll notice, best drinking water, best urban drinking water any place in the United States, much better than this city, for instance. And it's, it all comes out of that watershed. So there's a great example of a public payment to uh, private landowners. Cap and trade, let's just go back here. Cap and trade is the, uh, is the third category. Um, that is Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. That is what many of you are, are probably thinking about now with the bills that are, that are coming through Congress in terms of our response to carbon. These are global cap and trade schemes. Um, uh, and, they're, and they're obviously quite important um, in terms of the, 
the future of some of these markets. The, the last category, and this is really kind of a typology of the type of instruments, the markets and payments you could think, are eco-labeling. Um, as a forester, I did um, a lot of work early on in helping launch something called the Forest Stewardship Council, which is an eco-label where they, um, um, they, they get into the to markets around the, uh, around the world as being timber coming from sustainably managed forests. There are coffee labels, there are cacao labels, there are lots of different eco-labels now that are also part of this thing that we call uh, ecosystem services and payments. Um, this is, you know, it's obviously much too busy, but the idea is this is the universe of ecosystem services and payments. We did a, a large matrix that tried to capture each of the types of markets or payments that are out there in the broad categories of carbon, water, and biodiversity uh, that exist. And there are about 24 or 25 different markets that we were able to identify and to try to understand what the characteristics of, the, of each of those markets are. The reason it's important to understand this universe and to think about them in different ways is because in different settings around the world, different tools will be useful for different opportunities. There's not sort of one payment for ecosystem service application that can be applied in every setting. It's complex, um, uh, but it's also diverse so that there are lots of tools that work in most all places around the world. I'm just going to briefly run through some of these markets. Again, I apologize if this is old, old material to, to folks here. The first market, obviously, and this is what, uh, what is being debated on the Hill now quite a bit, is the carbon market, the new carbon emission market that's out there. And um, first thing to remember is that it's really a young market. It was only about three and a half, four years ago that Kyoto was ratified when Russia finally came on. And out of that came what was called the, the European uh, Trading Scheme that came out, the EU ETS Trading Scheme. That was the beginning of this market. What is amazing, uh, unprecedented historically, is how fast this market's grown. So here we are in the, uh, and, 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 and this slide shows that it's really just not one market, but it's a range of different markets. You've got regulated markets, and so you've got the European uh, Emissions Trading Scheme up there, you've got the Clean Development Mechanism, which is part of the Kyoto Protocol, you've got the CCX, some of you might know that, the Chicago Climate Exchange, it's a voluntary scheme, you've got the, the, the uh, NSW, which is a Australian uh, trading scheme, uh, so you've got voluntary, regulated, it's a range of different kinds of markets in this category of carbon markets. And this just gives you a kind of a, 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 a brief glimpse of the, the scale of these markets and how fast they're growing. So we track them all, we try to get all the data. So on the top you have the voluntary market. The interesting thing for us about the voluntary market, that has been where all the action has been around what we call land use, land use change and forest. So any forestry transactions, any soil carbon transactions have happened in the voluntary market so far. And that's a market that is uh, grown between 2007 and 2008, uh, doubled at least. So it's gone from 350 million to 720 million bucks. Um, very small compared to the larger market. So this is the regulated market down at the bottom. So we're talking about um, a, a, a billion dollar market in the fourth year of its life. Never have we seen a market like this grow so quickly. There are many people in the financial sectors um, that make a living doing these kinds of productions, uh, like uh, Deutsche Bank and folks like that, that say the carbon market is going to be the largest commodity market in the world very, very soon, 2020. So, so it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. And what's interesting for us is that, that the rate of the growth of the voluntary market. And so the voluntary market is growing as quickly as the regulated market, which means that there are a lot of folks that don't find themselves in the regulated market. The regular, even in Europe, where you have many sectors that are regulated, there are organizations like the Forest Trends if we were in Europe. We offset our emissions. We're not going to ever be regulated. I live in a community, Brookmont, here outside of Washington. We're never going to be regulated as a community, but we want to participate. So you'll, you'll always see these range of different kinds of markets um, around, a little bit like the way the coffee market is today. You can get freeze-dried coffee, which is sort of the commodity coffee, or you can go down to Starbucks and pay a lot more for specialty coffees. I think we'll see bird-friendly, all those kinds of things. That is the kind of, uh, of market that I think we're going to see in the future in carbon. Uh, a very important 
piece of that carbon market for us is the application to conservation, forest, and more broadly terrestrial conservation, because it's not only forest, but it's soil um, that holds a lot of the carbon. Um, and what's been happening in the last year or a little bit more has been this very new movement around including forestry and terrestrial carbon into whatever agreement comes out of post-Kyoto. Historically, as I said, in the regulated market, there's been practically no forestry or land use. Um, but that's going to change very dramatically. And I think it's going to be a huge opportunity for conservation if we can get that right. And this is just, the, there was a report that came out a couple of years ago, the Stern Report, that people felt was very uh, very important in sort of valuing what that what that uh, contribution force made to, uh, to uh, the carbon equation. There is, there are, the estimates are roughly sort of 25%, a quarter of all the emissions that get in the atmosphere come from forests, forests being burned, or it's being converted to some other agricultural. So it's a quarter of the problem. Hopefully it should receive a quarter of the, the attention in terms of the solution. Very quickly, shifting from carbon to water, um, there are two types of, of, of water markets that one needs to think about, water quantity and water quality. And, um, and we think that in the next, uh, in the next set of real significant markets after carbon markets are gonna be water markets. And, What's interesting about water is carbon, the, the structures we're putting into place, the markets we're developing for carbon are really an intermediary step to move away from a carbon-based economy. We will not find something that will allow us to move away from a water-based. So we're gonna have water in our lives forever. So this is why it's gonna be, maybe over the long term, a more important market than carbon markets are even. Uh, we have launched a project here in the Chesapeake Fund, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, called the Chesapeake Fund, which is looking at the leading um, problem in water, which is uh, nitrogen that finds its way into freshwater systems, uh, creating hypoxic zones, which are basically dead zones. So the Chesapeake, if you go out in a little bit in August, what you'll see is a lot of green algae out there. That is hypoxia. That's literally killing off anything that lives in that water system. Um, it is a problem that is a global problem. Um, there was something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, a really foundational report that came out about five years ago where 3,000 scientists from around the world took the temperature of the globe to say, how are we doing, how are our systems doing? They said the leading global environmental challenge is not climate change, it is water pollution and it's nitrogen in the water. So this is even more urgent in some ways than climate change. And then flipping to kind of the third mega category, if you would, around uh, ecosystem service markets, we talked about biodiversity as those markets. Biodiversity, of course, is, is really the hardest of these because it's the, the concept of biodiversity is that it's a web of interaction. So to think about creating a commodity around biodiversity markets is, is very complex for sure. But, um, but what's interesting is that there uh, are a lot of examples here in the United States. The United States is the world's leading uh, example on markets for biodiversity. We cannot claim that for these other markets. We certainly cannot claim that for climate or water. But we are the leading authority with, with uh, the place with the, the most uh, experience around some of these different types of markets. The shape they take are wetland mitigation banking, conservation banking, uh, voluntary biodiversity offsets. So you see these instruments being used by, by businesses that are trying to put in another installation someplace on a wetland and they need to offset that. Um, these, uh, these markets are based on, on both the, the uh, Clean Air and Clean Water Acts as well as the Endangered Species Act. So there's, there's a great example where for markets really to achieve global uh, and, and large scale impacts, they need regulatory constructs around them. And this is a great example for that. Um, so we have, and another thing, if you remember anything about what I said, is that these are all emerging environmental markets. They're all very young. The carbon market, it's a billion dollar market, but it is a four year young market. It's truly a four year old. And some of these markets are, are, are less developed than the carbon market. So you run into a lot of problems, the, sort of the, the, the mechanics of these markets, how do they work, the instrumentation in a market that makes the market function that are not in place right now. So that's why the bills that we are negotiating on the Hill now 
Um, a lot of the work that a lot of the environmental organizations are starting to do is going to be really fundamental in developing the in instrumentation of these markets so that conservation is deliverable, so that local communities can benefit from these emerging markets. And, and finally, I just wanted to leave with you um, a couple of our websites. Um, you know, this is the family of forest trends, if you would. But maybe the most robust website up there is the ecosystemmarketplace.com website, which basically we, we've launched what we hope is going to be the Bloomberg of environmental markets. We track all these markets. We track transactions, prices, how-to tools, who's doing what globally. And so that, and it's, and it's, uh, uh, it's a very robust um, resource. So I hope you can tie into it. But thank you. I just wanted to give a brief introduction and then turn it over to Donald.